<laughs> well, good morning. Today is, man, just one of those days again that we get to celebrate with folks as they have given their life to Jesus. We get to walk with them through this. Um, they both understand that it's not the water that saves, but only through a relationship with Jesus that they have eternal life. And both of these people have given their life to Jesus, um, and today they're following through in believer's baptism. This is Wayne, and uh, over the last couple of days, couple of weeks, I've actually been talking to one of our ministers, Ty, uh, and then even talked with one of our deacons and just uh, came to that moment where he gave his life to Jesus. Uh, they talked to him through uh, what that means, what that looks like, uh, understanding what baptism is. So, Wayne, who is the Lord of your life? Jesus. Based on that profession in Jesus, I can baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is Miss Christina. Miss Christina's been coming for a little bit, and we've been talking over the last several weeks, and uh, she's given her life to Jesus a while back, but just following through in the right order with her baptism, understanding again, it's not the water, but it's through Jesus. So Miss Christina, who is the Lord of your life? Jesus Christ. Based on that profession of Jesus, I can baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I got you. I got you. Good job. Let's stand and worship him this morning as Amy leads us.
Hey, you guys can go ahead and be seated. We've got a lot of things that are happening in our service today. We're going to pray over a mission team that will be leaving this next week to go to Honduras in just a moment. Uh, This is the time where we take up our tithe and offering. And then as well, today is a day where uh, our personnel team, they're wanting to do some recognitions on behalf of the church. And so I was sitting there and I'm like, how in the world do we accomplish all this? Uh, Well, I hope you're in no hurry is all I've, no, no. Here, and can I tell you the most important thing we're going to do today? We're going to talk about Jesus. That's the most important thing that we're going to do. And the very things that I mentioned are not in opposition of that. I think they go hand in hand with that. So with that being said, let me recognize the chairman of our personnel team, uh, Bill Husfeld. Bill and his team are going to come up and they're going to share some things with you. Bill, would you join us right here at the front, sir? Welcome, Bill. Would you do that this morning? Sure. There we go. Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate that. And I think all of you know Chris as well, and, and Linda's back there, and I know Randy's somewhere here, and Don uh, Pitts. Uh, we, we're on the personnel committee, and, and we, we're so fortunate to be able to do this. Um, across the country, October is Pastor and Staff Appreciation Month, and so we were working on a schedule trying to figure out when to do it. Uh, and so, you know, Sundays is after Saturday football season, and so we were pretty sure we were going to win. You were pretty sure you were going to win. But it's Tennessee. They had a bye week this week, so we felt good about it. Uh, we, we thought Steve would be feeling pretty good, so that's why we picked this week. Seriously, though, we, we love our staff and appreciate them so much, and I'm going to let Chris start off a little bit about why. Uh, we're going to recognize several, several people, but more importantly, probably their spouses, too, because they are uh, very instrumental in, in making sure that uh, where they're prayed for and uplifted and, and supported. But everybody that comes up here um, in a moment, they have dedicated themselves to spreading the gospel of Christ. And, you know, a lot of those uh, that you may have a personal relationship with, you may know them, some you may not, but I can vouch for each and every one of them, and I know Bill can too. They are extraordinary individuals that love talking about Jesus. And as Stephen said a while ago, you know, we're – they, they, they bring the message each and every Sunday, but they bring the message each and every day if you see them out. So they're wonderful people, and we want to recognize them. Now, I will say this, Bill, we might need to, and, and Stephen, you probably want to be a part of this because I had to collect all these checks from the first service, and I'm not going to name names, Corey, but some of them didn't want to give their checks back. <laughs> and I don't know if he was thinking he's going to get a second one in the second service, but um, we, we want to recognize them now, and I'll, uh, Bill, if you'll, Give out the, the names here. We'll give up. The they didn't trust me the money. Chris has got the checks, and Teresa's going to help us with the, the gifts for the spouses. So uh, Scott Bess and uh, Ashley are out of town. They could not be here. And like I said, it's kind of hard to get everybody in. And so, unfortunately, we're, we're not going to be able to stand here and recognize them, but we do appreciate their work. Um, and then Ty Clark and Catherine. Uh, Ty is our minister of uh, middle school and community outreach. There he is. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Trick, tricked us from the first service. And then uh, Corey Gann and Savannah, Minister of Worship and Missions. You know, and I had a deja vu moment. And I, I, Calvin, I've got to tell you and Debbie this. It was almost like yesterday I remember Calvin and Debbie standing up there singing and Corey didn't even exist. And so it's just just... I'm just getting old. Um, Tammy Kirkland and uh, Terry, Director of Children's and Preschool Ministry, and she's... Oh, Terry did make it. He's not getting the lotion that Tammy's getting. He's getting his own thing. This is always a challenge for us with with him. And then uh, Robbie Martin, Minister of High School Students. Uh, Katie, obviously, is at home with a new baby. And then uh, Ryan Tucker uh, and Jen, Minister of College, Young Adults, and New Members. And I told the first service, every time we listen to a song on radio, it seems like Teresa says, Jen can sing that better than they're singing it on the radio. I mean, you can say something about every one of these folks. They're just amazing what all they do, and we just love them to death. Um, Bill Tucker, uh, Minister of Military, and Lydia.
Now we're getting into the big guns. Dr. Wayne Grothman, Executive Pastor of Worship. Kathy? And, and, and I've just come up with a new name for the next one. This is our WD-40 man, Dr. Carl Fonder, an Executive Pastor and Brenda. He does everything works with Carl. There they are. He can fix anything. And then not, uh, certainly not last, uh, in, in, in our leader that we just love and trust and, and just watching them in their lives just encourages all of us, Dr. Stephen Kyle and Jennifer. Look, they do amazing things. They, as Chris said, they just love Jesus and point us in that direction. And it's so comforting to know that I know I'm going to be fed the word that I'm supposed to be fed when I come in this sanctuary or anytime I listen to him. If you don't listen to the podcast, you need to do that. Uh, but uh, Stephen, thank you for being the, the, the man of God you are. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So so over the last 13 years as I've been your pastor, uh, God has been so good, and God has allowed us to assemble the staff that you see on either side of me. And I say this regularly, I believe this with all my heart, this is the best church staff in the world, hands down. <laughs> Everyone, they're uniquely gifted and Created Now, I did not know that Carl could fix anything because I've got some stuff I need Carl to fix. Um, but uh, anyway, it's just neat how God does that. And I want to speak on their behalf. And just let me say today, thank you guys for uh, supporting us. Thank you guys for encouraging us, praying for us. Thank you guys uh, for most of the time being incredibly easy to lead. Most of the time. Most of the time. But thank you guys for uh, making the gospel of Jesus Christ the most important thing. And, uh, and we feel that. We feel that. We've all served in, you know, different churches and stuff. And, um, you know, we just say all the time, my goodness, we are blessed to be able to get to serve here at Highland Park. You know, today is special as well because uh, it is, we're also celebrating Ryan and Jen's 10-year anniversary of being here at Highland Park. So we're thankful for that. And I'll tell you guys, I am incredibly proud of you. Uh, I'm incredibly proud that, you know, not only here in the community, but around the world, because God allows our church to touch and make differences all around the world. But I'm incredibly proud for people to know that I am the pastor of Highland Park Baptist Church. And so we believe the greatest days of ministry are the days ahead. Now, I don't know about you, I'd love it if Jesus tonight just said, nah, I'm going to go ahead and come back now. I won't miss a beat. Thank you, Jesus. We'll leave it down there to some other folks. Um, but as long as he tarries, we're going to be faithful uh, with you guys to go hand in hand and make sure the world knows about Jesus Christ. So would you help me and go ahead one more time and thank our staff for being able to serve as this church family. And one of the things that we want to do as well, this Saturday, we have a mission team of 15 that will be headed off to Honduras, and um, they will be uh, doing a dental mission trip. And so we've got some dentists, some oral surgeons, some hygienists, 
And then we have other folks that are going to go. And as, you know, following the model that we always do, we're going to earn the right to be heard. We're going to meet a physical need. So in turn, we might help with the greater, which is the spiritual need. And as uh, one of our guys was telling me earlier, you know, Pastor, I have found that when somebody's in the chair and I'm messing with their teeth, they'll listen to a lot. Um, So uh, anyway... So this week, we're blessed as a church family. Just let me stop and say this. It is because of your faithful giving as a church that we're able to do all the things that we do. We have the resources that we do not only to go to Honduras, but to be able to plant churches, uh, some of which in our own state, some in our own nation, some outside of our nation. And as well, we're able to go, as Bill mentioned earlier, in all the schools that we find ourselves in each and every week. It's because of your giving and you being obedient to the Lord that we're able to do that. So I want to ask those that are going to be a part of our mission team leaving this week if they would go ahead and come down front. And we want to have a special time of prayer for them. And this would also be a time for our ushers to go ahead and come forward because this will be a time that we want to pray over our offering. I know a few folks are out. I know of one of our doctors who, y'all turn around where everybody out there can see you. One of our doctors got a call into the hospital this morning with an emergency. Now, my own dentist is down here. Doc, what if I have teeth trouble while you're out of the country? I've got somebody on call. Okay, good, good. (laughs) I'm getting a little worried there. Um, Hey, let's do this. Would some of you come and let's gather around this team and let's pray over them. This will also be a time where we offer uh, God's blessing upon our offerings. So would you guys just gather around? Uh, I need some folks to come and help me and we'll lay hands on them and we'll pray over them. We need some folks that'll come and gather right. Carl, nobody wants to lay hands on you, brother. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe some of our deacons or somebody that would come and believes in the power of prayer fantastic. All right. Hey, let me remind you, you can give electronically. You'll see a slide on the screens or you can put something in the offering bucket that is this past today. But let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for every man and woman that is standing here that will be a part of this trip. Lord Jesus, our prayer is that you would use them in ways that are greater than any that they could imagine or any that they have prepared for. Lord Jesus, I, I, we pray today that, Lord, this would be a week that their faith would increase, that this would be a week that you would teach them more about you, that this would be a week as they learn about sacrifice and they learn about service. May they also fall greater in love with you. And Lord, our prayer is that right now you would be preparing the hearts of the people that they're going to be serving, that they're going to be ministering to, that Lord, hearts would be open to hear of the greatest gift anyone could ever receive, and that is you, Jesus, and the salvation that you offer through your grace. So our prayer is that you would give them safety in their travels. Our prayer is that you would, you would give them good health. Our prayer is that you would be with their families and their places of business as they're away, and that, God, may you change lives And may countless come to know you as their Lord and Savior because of the willingness and obedience of this team to go. Thank you, Lord, that even though they don't know how the week may lay out and everything that they're going to do and how they're going to serve all these people, I just thank you, Jesus, that they already know what they're going to tell them. Thank you that the gospel message is just as powerful and needed in Honduras as it is here in Panama City. That it transcends cultures, languages, people groups. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, our prayer is that as we take this offering today, that you would bless it, you'd break it, you would multiply it. Thank you, God, that you have blessed us so in turn we might be blessings to others. Thank you for how you continue to provide resources for our church, not only to do this mission trip, but to be able to earn the right to be heard. And so our prayer is that you would help us to continue to be obedient in this area and that, God, that you would use it to do things that are greater than any could ever happen if it remains in our own pocket. You are good and you are worthy of worship and praise. So as we give you this gift, it is an act of worship. It's an act of faith just as we sing these songs. 
All hail King Jesus. You are King of all kings and you are worthy of our praise. We look forward to the report that we're going to hear of what you're done, you've done through these people and for your kingdom. For it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you thank God for these that are going today?
We appreciate our praise team and our choir and those that lead us in worship. If you have your Bibles this morning, open up to the book of John, chapter 7. We're continuing verse by verse through our study of the book of John, a series entitled Life in His Name. And today we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 20 of John, chapter 7. And some of you are like, well, we don't have enough time. <laughs> that is called the miracle. Okay, we'll get through all of it this morning. But before we jump into the text, I want to take a little bit of time and, uh, and I want us to pray for Israel. Um, some of you or many of you are probably aware of what has taken place in Israel. I was speaking to someone just before the service that was supposed to be leaving next week to go to Israel and that trip has had to be postponed. Uh, but and it may have changed, but before I left my study this morning, over 600 uh, Israelis have died, thousands more wounded in a terrorist attack uh, from Hamas. And so Psalm 122 tells us 
that we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I had somebody challenge me on this, not this morning, but a while back, and they're like, oh, that's Old Testament. And here was my response to them. Last time I checked, mine's still connected. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray, I think we would all agree, that one of the reasons that we have been so blessed is because we have always stood with God's people, and God blesses those who bless his people. And so I think it would be appropriate for us just to spend a little bit of time in prayer. Could you do that this morning? Would you bow with me before we get into our text? Father, this morning we are following your leadership, your directive in Psalm 122, where you tell us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And Father, right now we know that there are many families that are grieving because of loved ones that have passed. We pray that you would minister to them. Father, we pray that you would be with the thousand more that are wounded in hospitals. Father, we pray that you would be with the leadership of this country as they're making vital decisions. And Father, we in turn pray that you would be with the leadership of our country, that we would stand with your people. Lord Jesus, our prayer is that you would take this, something clearly that has been intended to bring harm, and Father, may you use this to draw your people unto yourself. Lord, our prayer is that there would be a mighty revival that would happen, and they would come to Jesus. You are the Prince of Peace. We know that one day you're going to split the sky wide open, and you're going to return, and you're going to... You're going to fix everything that sin has polluted in this world. Father, we look forward to that day. But we know the day that we live in now. And so our prayer is that you would work in a fashion, in a way that only you can work. We ask that you would bring peace to your people and to Israel. And we pray this in the name of the one who brings us peace. Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, one of the reasons why there is always constant turmoil in the Middle East is because of family dynamics. Unfortunately, Abraham made a foolish decision because God was not working on his timetable. And uh, because of Isaac and Ishmael and their constant battling against each other and we have the Palestinians and we have the Jews and we continue to see that. I'm just saying this, that uh, it seems as though there's a lot of, a lot of problems that happen within every family. I don't want you to raise your hand this morning, but have you ever had to deal with problems within your family? We all have, right? And so if you've ever had to deal with problems within your family today, you're going to be able to identify with our text. Because in our text of Scripture today, we're going to see Jesus as well dealing with problems and difficulties within his own family. Now, if I were picking out passages of Scripture that I was going to preach on, I probably would not have chosen this particular passage of Scripture. When people invite me to come and preach in revivals and conferences and leadership things, very seldom, well, never has someone said, ooh, would you come and deal with the first 20 verses of John chapter 7? I have sugar sticks. This is not a sugar stick. But... I love the fact that God's word is always right on time. That every single bit of scripture, right, is profitable to you and I. So with that being said, take your Bibles this morning and look in John chapter 7. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 20. Okay, if you don't have a Bible, don't worry. The scripture will be on the screens. And as always, if you don't have a copy of God's word, a Bible, stop by the Welcome Center. We would love to give you one of those before you leave today. He writes in verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee 
For he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. And then Jesus said to them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I'm not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he has said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, uh, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. And then the Jews sought him at the feast. And they said, where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, he's good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jewish leaders. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and he taught the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but it is his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? And the people answered and said, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Now, everything that happens in John chapter 7 happens in the course of a week. They were celebrating one of the three major feasts among the Jewish people, the Feast of Tabernacles, or it's otherwise known as the Feast of Tents. And the way they would celebrate that is each Jewish family would go outside of their house and much like camping, they would build this little structure and they would take like tree limbs and lean them together and then they would take leaves and they would make a roof on it, but they would build this temporary structure and for the entire feast, that's where they would live. That's where they would sleep. They did that to remember the Jews, as they were wandering through the desert in their time of disobedience, right? And so that's what was taking place when this was happening. Now, out of all of the Jewish feasts, the Feast of Tabernacles was usually the one with the greatest celebration. What we're going to see is, though, Jesus is going to take a time of great celebration, and he's going to turn it into a time of confrontation. You know, families can be tough. Families can be hard. I think I've shared with you that growing up, I loved reading the Peanuts cartoon strip. I saw one uh, one time, and I saw it again not too long ago, and Linus is there. Linus is laying on the floor. He's got his blanket with him. He's watching television. All of a sudden, his older sister Lucy walks in, and without saying a word, she walks up and changes the channel on the television. Linus says, well, hang on just a second. What, what are you doing? Why are you changing the channel? I was here first. To which Lucy replied, well, Jesus said, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. In the last frame, Linus is there, and Linus is saying, but I bet you Jesus didn't have an older sister. <laughs> well, he didn't have an older sister because he was the firstborn, but he did have brothers and sisters, and they didn't always get along. And as we study this passage of Scripture today, I love the fact that it shows that Jesus clearly identifies with us. Here's what I mean by that. Jesus had to deal with dis discouragement. Jesus had to deal with division. Jesus also had to deal with disappointment. Let's look at these today. 
First of all, I want us to look at the discouragement from relationships in Jesus' life. Every single one of us grew up in some kind of family. Whether it be your biological family, whether it be an adoptive family. I've even heard folks make this statement, you don't get to choose your family. Usually, they don't say it in a kind way, if you know what I mean. And that's really true. You don't get to choose your family, but we all grow up in some family. And every time you have people living together, there's going to be friction. You'll find this hard to believe. But sometimes brothers and sisters don't get along. Sometimes parents and children don't get along. For some reason, we have these expectations that every family should be perfect and every family should not have any conflict. And when that doesn't happen, it leads to discouragement. I love the story of this lady who was teaching a children's Sunday school class. And she said to the boys and girls, now boys and girls, they were talking about the Ten Commandments. Now boys and girls, we know the commandment that has to deal with the relationship between children and their parents. It is honor your father and your mother. But boys and girls, let me ask you, does anyone here know a commandment that has to deal with the relationship between brothers and sisters? One little boy's hand shot up immediately. He goes, oh, I know this. I know this. Please pick me. I know this one. She said, okay. What is the commandment that has to deal with brothers and sisters? He said, that's easy. Thou shalt not kill. (laughs) And he wasn't far from the truth, was he? We see it even happening in the life of Jesus. You know, the very first set of brothers, Cain and Abel, didn't get along. Cain killed Abel. Joseph's own brothers sold him into slavery. And you might be surprised that Jesus had a conflict between he and his siblings. So let's look at the discouragement from some relationships within his life. First of all, he was held in contempt by his own family. Now, Jesus was the firstborn of Mary. But according to the New Testament, he had other brothers and sisters. They were half-brothers and sisters. They had the same mother, Mary, but they had different dads. We know Jesus was the supernatural son of God, but the rest of the siblings were natural children of Mary and the carpenter, Joseph. So Jesus, I guess you could say this, Jesus was a part of a blended family, just like some of you are. Over in Mark chapter 6, we read about his family. It even gives us the names of his brothers. I want you to look at Mark 6, 3 on the screen. It says, the people following Jesus ask, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Hosez, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. Now, I want you to circle two of those names in that text. James and Judas. Judas is otherwise known as Jude. These two half-brothers would eventually believe in Jesus. They would go ahead and they would write two New Testament books that bore their names. Yet we're seeing right now in John chapter 7, they're not there yet. In John chapter 7, they don't believe in what Jesus is saying. So our text tells us this. They give him some advice. Why don't you go on up to the festival in Jerusalem? Why they did that, we don't know. Bible scholars and commentators that I read, they kind of gave two different motivations. But again, we don't really know. And I don't know that it's important that we do know. But the first one said, well, maybe they thought their brother Jesus had a chance to succeed in Jewish politics in Jerusalem. So they advised him to go up and launch his public campaign. That they were saying, hey, hey, you should try the big stage instead of backwoods Galilee. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that one. But again, in the end, it doesn't really matter. I, too, I do tend to agree with the second one. They may have been using sarcasm. Now, could you believe that there would be sarcasm between brothers? That they could have been using sarcasm and they could have been saying, since you're so high and mighty, why don't you just go on up to Jerusalem and why don't you perform your magic tricks for them? Or are they too uh, sophisticated for a backwoods boy like you? I don't know, but I do know this. Unfortunately, many times we use our own words to hurt our family members. 
There was a dad one day that was talking to his lazy teenage son. Now, if you have a teenage boy, I know you would never think of them as lazy. But he was talking to his lazy teenage son, and here's what he said. Abraham Lincoln, when he was your age, son, he was splitting rails. He was splitting logs. His son thought for a moment, and he said, well, you know, dad, when Abraham Lincoln was your age, He was president of the United States. We often use words to hurt our own family members. And maybe you're like me, you're reading this, and you're like, this is a little ironic to see the siblings of Jesus, and they didn't believe in him. That it must have been a heartache to Jesus that his family didn't understand him, and his family didn't believe him. And maybe you can understand that today because you've experienced that as well. Your family doesn't believe in you. Your family doesn't understand you. Maybe you would even admit, I'm walking through that valley, Pastor, right now. It's tough when you're rejected by members of your own family. But be encouraged. Jesus understands the pain that you're experiencing right now. Because he was held in contempt by his own family. He was discouraged. But then secondly, not only his own family, he was hated by the world. He wasn't being deceptive in verse 8. If you look at it again, when he basically told his half-brothers he wasn't going to go up for the full festival, he just didn't want to arrive when all the crowds were arriving. Instead, he stayed in Galilee. The scripture says that he shows up right in the middle of the eight-day celebration. And when he shows up, he immediately starts teaching in the temple courts. And as he was teaching and as he was preaching, there were those that were hearing his message, the very ones that he came to deliver the message to, and they hated the message. And so they attacked the messenger. They hated his message for the very same reason the world hates his message today. They hated Jesus for the very same reason the world hates his followers today. Look in verse 7. Look at what Jesus said there in verse 7. He said, the world hates me because I testify about it. Here it is, that its works are evil. They hated Jesus because Jesus had the nerve to say that their sinful behavior was evil. Do you know it hadn't changed? It creates hostility today. Nobody likes to be told that their behavior is wrong. Nobody likes to be told that their behavior is morally wicked. No one likes to hear that what they're doing, again in the case of this passage, is evil. You know, the world, it doesn't mind religion. For the most part, the world doesn't even mind religious practices. But when we start calling sin what sin really is, the reaction is always the same and the reaction is hate. And did you know this? Did you know that Christians who hold a biblical world view of morality and sexuality, did you know that they are actually labeled as hate groups today? I said, did you know that? Yeah, that'd be a time to say, yeah, I knew that. Or no, I didn't know that. Wake up, guys. You're acting like the first service today. There, 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 is a, there is a Southern Poverty Law Center. It's based out of Montgomery. It was started in 1971 for the right reasons, to actually help litigate against racial discrimination. But what has happened over the last several years is it has become a misguided whistleblower for their own definition of hate groups. Every year they'll publish a brand new list of hate groups And a lot of the names on the list are accurate, like the KKK and the Aryan Brotherhood. But on the same list is the Alliance Defending Freedom. The same list, the Family Research Council. Look it up. Those are Christian groups who dare to define sexuality and marriage according to biblical principles. And because they dare to say, here's what the Bible says, they're labeled as a hate group. 
Some of you guys remember when we were walking through Romans and we were dealing with Romans chapter 1 and we were simply saying, here's what the Bible says when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to what sin is. And I preached a sermon entitled, The Issue of Homosexuality. There were folks that as I was preaching that message actually got up and left and have never come back. That the message, when it went online, that there were folks that were saying, this man is so full of hatred, this man is so contempt, this man is such a narrow-minded individual, I can't believe anyone would believe what he believes. And yet we simply said, here's what the Bible says. Any, any sexual activity outside of the confines of marriage between one man and one woman, the Bible declares, is sin. And we were hated for it. That's what Christ is saying in this passage of Scripture here. You know what? I'm preaching, right? I'm teaching, and I'm calling out their lifestyle is evil, not being according to God. And when we start calling sin what it really is, the reaction is always the same, and the reaction is hate. But Jesus said, you shouldn't be surprised by that, guys. It's always been that way. He said, they hated me because I spoke the truth. Why would you expect them not to hate you as a follower of Christ for speaking the same truth? The good news is, though, he's given us instructions of how you and I should react when we're hated. Look at the screens. Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. Blessed are you when men hate you. Well, now hang on just a second. That didn't sound right. Blessed are you when men hate you. Any of you feel blessed when men hate you? I don't. I want everybody to like me. You're like, I don't believe that. It's true. I do want people to like me. Early on in ministry, Jennifer used to kid, and she would say this. And I, don't, she hadn't said, I don't know if she said it a lot recently, but it's like this. Your spiritual gift is making people mad. Whether it's a spiritual gift or not, I don't know. But the younger I was, boy, I had it. (laughs) He says, blessed are you when men hate you. That flies in the face of what what we want to what we want to believe. He says, blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. And then check this out, guys. This makes no sense. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. What day? When they hate you for the sake of the Son of Man. Makes no sense. For indeed, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner, their fathers did to the prophets. And so when folks started saying bad things about me or when folks say bad things about me or, you know, I throw myself a little pity party and I sit there and, you know, when I was young and I would pastor these small little churches, there's one church, I'm just telling you, I think it would have helped out if the folks in the church got saved. I mean, they're just so mean, mean, mean. God brought it into my life, so I would really appreciate most of you. And they got so mad and they got so upset when I started baptizing people that were of different skin color. And I sat in a meeting, and my wife will tell you we're young. She's out in the hallway, and I'm yelling at deacons. Deacons are yelling at me. She's out there praying, and we've got two small little kids, and she's thinking he's going to lose his job. He's going to lose his job. We're not going to be able to provide. And I can remember I would, I would go home after those meetings, and there was one time I went home, and, and this is when the, king, uh, the queen had just died. Not the most recent one, but the one before that. And I was sitting there, and I was watching the funeral, and I was, I was watching everything take place and how they were, they were doting on her and her dead body and the process, procession and everything that was taking place. And usually my best therapy was this. I would go home and I would get a, uh, you know, I don't know, a quart or a pint or a half gallon of ice cream, and I just kind of sat there and I would just do some therapy. 
And I can remember very clear as day sitting there and watching all this take place. And I'm like, she never suffered for you a day in her life, Lord. She never pastored a small little northern Mississippi town church that is against the gospel and that is making her life miserable. She didn't go through all that. Look at all the crowns she has. Look at the big deal they're making of her. Look at how uh, they're exalting her name and lights and everything else. And here I am down here, this little old bitty church, and nobody likes me and nobody cares for me. Where's my reward? And the Holy Spirit said, well, now, she's got her crowns now. Mm. Your crown will come one day. Hear me, guys. As long as we're true to the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, we cannot be expected to be received and accepted and loved by the world. He says, they hated me. They're going to hate you. But he doesn't tell us to respond in the same way. He says, rejoice in that day. Don't revolt. Don't resign. Rejoice when you're discouraged from relationships. But then secondly, we see division. It's 1138. Can I give you the division one? Will y'all stay here for a little bit longer? Well, good, because good, I still got 20 minutes now. Hang on, y'all. <laughs> the division over truth. When you read this passage of Scripture, it's very obvious here that the people were divided about the truth about Jesus. And I think you would agree he's still the great divider. Eh, people today still disagree about three important beliefs about Jesus. The first one is Jesus' influence. Can I, let me put it in form of a question today. What right did he have to say the things he said? What, what right... And he answers the question, look back in verse 16, or verse 15 of John 7. We read there, the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters, having never studied? Now, I use the New King James translation, and it says letters there, but you use other translations. Here's what it means. How does he know the Old Testament letters? Or we would say this, how does he know the Old Testament books? How does he know the Scripture? He's never been to rabbinical school. He's never had formal training. He's never been to seminary. How does he know this stuff? And Jesus answered them, and look at what he said. My doctrine isn't mine, but it's his who sent me. Jesus didn't teach like the other rabbis did. The other rabbis, and they did and they still do, they would say, oh, the Talmud says this, or they'll say the Torah says this, or they'll say, Rabbi so-and-so says this. But Jesus was different. Why? Because over and over again, Jesus would say, truly, truly, I say unto you. Truly, truly, I say unto you unto you. He says, I'm speaking the very words of my heavenly Father who has sent me. That's a bold claim. Often I'll have people that'll come up and here's what they'll say. Pastor, God told me to tell you and then they say something. Now, if it's scripture, first of all, I always listen to it, but if it's scripture, I'm like, hmm, there may be some truth in that. But a lot of times they'll come up and they'll say something like this. Hey, God told me to tell you next Sunday, you need to preach on the second coming of Jesus. Or God told me to tell you that the worship center is too cold. (laughs) Or God told me to, I mean, you, you can only imagine what is going to be said there. And here's what I always think. Well, that's crazy. Why would he tell you to tell me? Why didn't he just go ahead and tell me himself? I spoke to him this morning. So this is a pretty bold claim that Jesus is doing right here. Jesus is sitting here, and Jesus is saying, I am speaking on behalf of God. And when he said, God told me to tell you, you better listen, you better obey. And so here's the question that every one of us have to answer for ourselves. Can I truly trust the words of Jesus that I find in the Bible? I believe those are the only words that you can trust. 
the words of the Bible. The Bible is the only truth that we have that does not change from individual to individual. There are folks out there today, and here's what they say. Well, you know what? I can believe what I want to believe, and it can be right for me, and you can believe what you want to believe, and it can be right for you. It can be in stark contrast to each other. I may believe something's wrong for me, but you believe it's right for you, so it's right for you. Or you may live in this part of the world, in this culture, so it'll make it right for you. Or right, Listen, the Word of God transcends all of that from individual to individual from culture to culture, from language to language. I mean, we mentioned that in our prayer with our Honduras mission team, that the gospel, it doesn't matter if they speak Spanish. It doesn't matter what color their skin is. The gospel doesn't matter what, what their background was or what cultural things that they adhere to. It is available to all who will come and all who will believe. And so the word of God is the same. Students, I know that you're told this all the time. Well, those are days of old. That's just some old fable stuff. That's just what your parents and your grandparents' belief, but you don't need to believe it today because we're a lot more sophisticated. Friends, hear me. The only thing that you can believe is the Word of God today, tomorrow, next week, and next year. Man, I'm glad I didn't quit. It took you that long to wake up this morning. And so every person has to decide. Am I going to believe his influence? Am I going to believe his words? Here's the second division, his integrity. And by that I mean this, every person has to ask the question and answer it, who is Jesus Christ? G people disagreed about his integrity, his character 2,000 years ago, just like they do today. Look in verse 12. Look at what we read in verse 12. Some said he is good, others said no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. Now look down in verse 20. The people answered and said, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. There are some that said, he's got to be a good man. You remember what he did? He healed that man at the pool of Bethesda. That guy had been there for 38 years, lame, and he came along, and Jesus healed him. So he's got to be a good man. And then there are others that are like, oh, no, 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 he's not a good man. He's leading people not to keep the Sabbath laws. He's not a good man. He's got a demon. Hmm. So what about your opinion? Who is Jesus? I just want to remind you, it's impossible to say that Jesus was just a good teacher. He didn't leave us that option. He claimed to be God. Later on, we're going to get to verse 38, and in verse 38, he's going to yell it out among the crowd. He's going to say, if anyone among you is thirsty, let him come unto me and let him drink. And he says, the person who believes in me will have springs of living water that will flow out of him. And I read that, and I'm like, just when I think he has said the boldest thing, he makes another bold claim. He's speaking as though he's God. There are only three options that Jesus left us when he claimed to be God. The first one, he claimed to be God, and he knew that he wasn't. And hear me, guys, that wouldn't make him a good man. That'd make him a liar. The second option is that he claimed to be God. He really thought that he was God, but he wasn't God. He was just crazy. As my grandmother used to say, he's as crazy as a Bessie bug. Have y'all heard that before? Y'all more sophisticated than I am? You're like, I heard he's crazy as a bed bug. A bed bug is not crazy, but a Bessie bug is. You're like, what does it look like? Well, it's crazy. That's all I know. Here's the third option. He claimed to be God and he really was. You've heard this said before. Was he a liar? Was he a lunatic? Or was he Lord? What do you say? So there was division among the people about his influence, about his integrity, his character, right? And then the third division was this, his identity. Back up in chapter 6, verse 38, he makes an amazing declaration there. I want you to look at the screens of the scripture. Look at it in your Bible. Jesus said, for I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And then back up in John chapter 6, the people said, well, hang on just a second. Isn't this, isn't this the son of Joseph and, and Mary? How can he claim that he came from heaven? He came from Joseph and Mary. And then later on in John chapter 7, the people will say, this man cannot be the Messiah. How do you know? Because he came from Galilee. So again, we go back to the question, is Jesus God? 
Here are the two choices. Do you really believe that Jesus existed with the Father from the beginning of the beginning as part of the eternal Godhead? Or do you believe that he was just a man born like everyone else with two human parents? The way you answer that question will determine your eternal destiny. And so here's what happens, and here's what we tend to do. There's some people that moan and complain, and they're like, the world and the culture that we live in is just so morally perverted. It's just so wicked. Oh, we, you know, I've had folks say, and I've even said it myself, 50 years ago, it's like the culture was much more accepting of the things of Christ and the teachings of the Bible than it is today. And we'll want to throw a poor pity party for ourselves, but guys, understand. Stand that we still don't have as tough a job as Christians in the first century. The Roman Empire was led by Nero, who was much more of a filthy moral sewer than we live in now. And in the midst of that spiritual and that moral darkness, the followers of Jesus Christ were persecuted. And we're like, oh, how terrible it would be if we were persecuted. But hear me, they thrived and their faith spread like wildfire throughout the empire. Now think about those believers living in that kind of moral swamp. And then think about our culture. I want you to hear the instructions that Paul gave to them, the first century church, and they're the same instructions that apply to you and I today. And let me remind you, just in case you think they had it easy, do you remember what Nero would do? Nero would take Christians, he would dip them in tar, he would tie them to posts, then he would set them on fire so he could illuminate his gardens, so he could ride around in his chariot, usually naked at night, to admire the beauty of his gardens. He would take young Christians and he would put them in leather bags filled with serpents and poisonous scorpions. And then he would throw it off into the water while they were alive. And as they floated down the water, being bitten over and over again by those poisonous reptiles. And yet, listen to what Paul said. This is Philippians 2, 14, 15, and 16. Look at the screens and we're almost done. Some of you guys need to really, really, if you, if you memorize scripture or you have, some of you guys, I know you'll take that scripture and you'll have it on a post-it note, maybe right there at your, uh, your mirror in the morning, or you'll have it right there on the dashboard of your car so you can just be reminded and meditate on that scripture. You don't have to write it all down, but let me encourage you to write the first, I don't know, first five or six words. Here they are. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. Hello. Maybe you get a t-shirt made with that on it, bumper sticker. I'm waiting for Corey to write a song about it. (laughs) Do everything without grumbling and arguing. Who's he writing to? The first century church that's being persecuted. He's writing to you and I. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world. How? By holding firm to the word of life. So he says, as we find ourselves in this culture and as we're remaining true to the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, when they hate the words that we bring, when they hate what we stand for. I know there, maybe you're here this morning, you're like, no, 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 not me. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and the world doesn't hate me. The world loves me. I dare you to say this. There is only one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus. You'll find out. He's just said, let's not argue but let's speak the truth in love. Friend, truth without love is cruelty, and love without truth is cowardice. We need both truth and love. And I don't want to burst your bubble, but I want to close with this. You know what I've discovered? I've discovered that even after you start following Jesus Christ, you will experience disappointments. You'll have to deal with the discouragement, even from those that you love. 
You'll have to deal with division over the truth. But you know what I've also discovered? I've discovered that when you're trusting in God, your disappointments can become his appointments. Here's what that means. It means that those of us who come to know God intimately have come to see that he will allow us to face adversity in order to conform us to the image of Christ. You say, well, I thought when I became a Christian, that meant I wasn't going to have to deal with any more pain or discouragement or disappointments. Matter of fact, I had somebody tell me that once I come to Christ, I wouldn't have to deal with any of this anymore. Friend, I've got one word for that person. Liar. No. God determined from the very beginning that he would shape us into the very image of his son. And part of his plan involves the painful removal of those things in our lives that are not reflecting the image of Jesus. There was a man that was traveling through God's country one day, the great smoky mountains of East Tennessee. And as he was making his way, if you've ever driven up through there, you know there's always these little shops and little gas stations and Stopped at a little gas station, and sure enough, there was this little shop next to it. And out in front of this shop, there was this old hillbilly. You know what I mean. This old hillbilly, like Elijah, was sitting there. And he was just whittling away on a block of wood and had this little chisel that was there. And next to him, he had all these different, we would call them works of art, but his product and it was amazing, the detail. The guy was sitting there looking at him, and he's like, oh, my goodness, this looks, this looks like a, just like a horse. And, you know, this one looks like a dog. The, oh, my, everything is just perfect. And so this guy stops, and he starts talking to this guy that's whittling, and he said, hey, are you the one that did this? And he goes, yeah, yeah, that's my stuff. And he said, my goodness, it's good. He said, can I ask you a question? And the old guy kind of smiled like, oh, he's going to ask me what everybody asked me. He said, how do you get a simple block of wood to look like an incredible, amazing dog? And he said, oh, oh that's easy. I just whittle away anything that don't look like a dog. <laughs> I, I, hear me, brother in Christ. Hear me, sister in Christ. That's the sanctification process that's happening right now. Oh, please understand. The life that you've been given was never meant to be exhausted on this world or the things of it. Here's what I mean by that. He's not finished with you yet. And he'll allow suffering, disappointments, disagreement, discouragement, division. He'll allow that to chisel away anything in your life that doesn't look like Jesus. Because he's making you into his very image. So Jesus knew about dealing with discouragement, pain. Sometimes those that you love the most can bring the greatest disappointment. But here's what he said. No, no, no. Don't worry about that. I'll work that for your good and for my glory. And you just keep on claiming my truth, believing my word, Believing who I am because I'm making you just like me. Would you bow your heads with me today? Your eyes closed. Here's how we're going to close this service. We're going to stand up and we're going to sing a song of great worship. Talking about the fact that Jesus did what you and I could not do. He paid the price for our sin. What's incredible about that, the Bible tells us that the very one who didn't sin 
is the one who paid the price for our sin. And I'm thankful that he's not just a halfway savior. He covered it all. You think of the worst sin that you've ever committed in your life. The blood of Jesus sufficiently will cover even that. And so we're going to praise him and thank him that indeed he paid it all. But I want to ask you today, do you know him as Lord and Savior? Have you received that gift of salvation that he offers to all who will believe? Would you say today, you know, he's Lord of my life. I've been forgiven. And every day he's making me more and more to his image. Could you say that? If today, if you can't say with absolute assurance that I know that I belong to Jesus, we're going to invite you to come. All along the front, there are going to be pastors up here. And maybe today you'd come and say, today I'm ready to get this thing settled with Jesus once and for all. I'm ready to call upon his name and believe in my heart. See, friend, even though his salvation is available to all who will come, it's not automatic. Not just going to happen. Oh no, he already did all that needs to happen. But today he offers you his gift of salvation and forgiveness. You say, what do I have to do? Believe. Receive. You're like, it seems simple. Oh, it's the greatest trade in the history of mankind. My sin. For Jesus' righteousness. He offers you that today. And so if you don't have that, we're going to invite you to come. There are others of you here that would say, you know what, Pastor? I find myself right now in that time of discouragement and disappointment. Could I just encourage you as a fellow, fellow struggler? Would you just keep your eyes on Jesus? Would you keep claiming the truth of his word? Would you keep believing him? That maybe today you would just say, Lord, hmm, it's hard, but Lord, I'm trusting you even in this. And then there are others of you in this room that while you know heaven will be your home when you take your last breath, you've got people in your life They don't have that. Maybe it's those that mock you at school or at work for being a Christian, for wanting to honor Jesus with your life. Maybe it's those that they want to debate and argue with you about biblical things. Friend, I want to say this. There is no power in winning an argument that is greater than the power that God gives to you through prayer. Here's what that means. More than winning a debate, when's the last time you prayed for them? Prayed for God to save them. Prayed for their hearts to be tender to the gospel praying that they'd see something different in you. Oh, yeah, keep speaking the truth. Oh, but you got to speak it in love. You're not taking great delight in the fact that they're lost, but you're broken over the fact that they're lost. When's the last time you bent your knee? When's the last time you cried hot tears of brokenness over the fact that if today were to be their last, hell would be their home? Would you pray for them? Oh, God, speak during this time. And may our focus, Jesus, be on you through all of it because you are the only hope that we have. We trust in you, Lord. Thank you for your incredible act of grace doing what we couldn't do for ourselves. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness.
just watch and pray Find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Sing it out. And don't praise the 